Hey, Mark, how's it going? Okay, I think I got everything set up. I think we're finally rolling. Hey everybody, how's it going? Tonight, I'm going to do some inking. I'm working on this page from the Lonesome Hunters. And um, yeah, usually I'm a little bit further on um, by this time of night, but um, it is what it is. This is where I'm at. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, the color palette um, for the last arc was something pretty specific. And um, to be honest, I'm still sort of feeling out where this next one is going to go um, color wise. One of the things, like, I think I got a little bit too dark with a lot of stuff. Um, in the first arc, which it was intentional. I was trying to get it very dark, but, um, you know, sometimes the thing you plan on just doesn't have the quite the effect you were hoping. Does anybody have any opinions about the audio tonight? I got a new microphone and, um, Sounds good on my end. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> it's 
So I was a little bit worried about working on this page on the stream tonight, but I decided it wasn't especially spoilery. This is the this is page four of the next um, series. Oh, thanks, Jeremy. I am having a blast doing it. It is one of the most fulfilling uh, projects I've ever worked on. Hey there, the letter hack. How's it going? Awesome. Thanks for dropping by. Still trying to figure out the streaming stuff. So if anybody has any questions or need me to do anything different, let me know. Yeah, I love watching people draw. Even though I do it all day myself, I'm like, I'm always surprised and fascinated by what, what people do and how they do it and the choices they make. And there's just a lot that goes into it. And yeah, even if you do it all day, it still feels mysterious sometimes.
Yeah, I agree. I love, actually, I love all sorts of process stuff. One of my absolute favorite things is watching those, um, the, the like, like YouTube videos where they just show a factory making, you know, pencils or light bulbs or something. Just seeing all the processes and, and everything is absolutely fascinating. Even if it's not artistic, you know, just sort of making mundane things is really fascinating. But making art is, I think, especially interesting. So I guess I should say I'm using um, acrylic ink. And I'm working on Strathmore uh, Series 400 mixed media paper. And I printed out, I did my pencils in Clip Studio Paint and then printed it out onto this paper. And I spent most of the day getting it to this point. And I'm doing the last bit. Well, not the last, last bit, but like the main, this is where sort of the whole page starts to come together when I'm doing my final inking pass. And I do like my black lines and then I will also do a little bit of a, an ink wash too over this and then do like a bunch of ink splatter and might do a little airbrush. I don't know. I don't know how far I'm going to get along tonight before I finally have to call it quits. Yeah, Jeremy, how it's made is the one of the shows. There's a bunch. Um, there's a bunch of Korean station or YouTube channels from Korea that do factory stuff. And there was a really great one. Um, actually, there's a bunch of really great ones in Pakistan. Um, unfortunately, with the floods, the, the YouTube channels seem to have mostly gone silent, which is really kind of upsetting, I guess. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I love, um, I didn't used to be able to ink at the very end. Well, I do like a two-part inking. You can kind of see, if I can figure out how to center this, I did like a brown inking pass. I've talked about this online and stuff a lot, but I do that very first, and it allows me to color everything. I can see where all my shapes are, and then, um, it's really fun when I ink this way because now like when I'm doing my black ink, I'm really just thinking about nailing the forms in a way that I, I wouldn't be if I was just doing black ink on white paper. Because the shapes are already there. I'm just like figuring out how to reinforce the lighting and reinforce the the shapes and been a fun way to work. I started doing this basically with um, Colonel Weird. Only instead of doing a brown under inking, I was doing like a gray under inking with that. Oh. The Russian guy who restores old motorcycles sounds like it could be really fun. There's a dude called Hand Tool Rescue. He's American, but he does like all sorts of um, refurbishing of old machines. Sometimes they're just like hand tools, and other times they're like mechanical, like lawnmowers and stuff. But he restores them to, so that they look like they just came off the factory off the factory floor and it looks awesome. <laughs> that D-Rexing was a fun thing. I, I can't remember exactly when I did that. I think I might've done that just before doing um, uh, my Witchfinder stuff. And so that was sort of my very first try at doing um, gray washes. 
because that's how I did my witch finder stuff. I did gray washes and then um, Dave Stewart uh, sort of turned my grays into different colors. It's funny. That's kind of why I, the one of the reasons why I started working on that um, that comic on my Instagram account, the Void Without, was because I wanted to do something that was just line work instead of uh, doing washes and watercolor and stuff. Well, and I wanted to practice using Clip Studio, and, and and that's sort of what defined the the style that I worked in was those two things. Oh, thanks, Jeremy. That was, I think, that was probably my best Mignola work. Was my Witchfinder stuff. The whole time I was doing BPRD, I was really struggling. But I think when I was doing Witchfinder, I sort of knew better what I was doing at that point. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, no, I was looking at those. Um, I was looking at those pages recently for something, and um, those foggy scenes were fun. I didn't like. I've, if you look at them, I didn't ink them. Well, I didn't ink them. I used a like a black pencil actually instead, which gave it such a nice soft feeling. Because if I remember right, I was going for like. A, you know, it was, it's like a flashback thing. So I was going for a, trying to make it feel like a memory, a little bit soft. But I think that I think that turned out good. In Lake of Fire, was that the one with the uh, the giant cat? That had to be the giant cat one, right? I can never remember the titles for half of the BPRT books. Yeah, that man, that cat was so hard. I mean, you saw it in the you see it in the sketchbook section of the trades. Like, I had to make a little maquette so I could figure out how to turn their head around because the only they were designed by um, uh, Raphael Albuquerque for the cover when he did the cover art, and then um, but he didn't do like a turnaround of the character or anything. He just drew the cover, so I had to figure out how to make how to make that work it was a, definitely a challenge it was fun though i made them out of uh super sculpey and then i just painted it with acrylic paint pretty sure i gave that to arcudi as a gift i think he has that I really, actually, I really like making maquettes. But I find I don't use them as much as I always sort of think I'm going to. Oh, 
Although, I guess with the um, the series that I'm working on right now, I did do a maquette for one of the characters. No, oh, you know what? And I did do I did a maquette for the uh, magpie queen in the last series, and used that a lot to try to get a, get that mask right. Yeah, I had so much stuff for that first sketchbook. And we actually, for the very first time, I think we ran out of pages before we could use all of it. So I think um, a lot of it isn't even going to make it into the sketchbook section. I should pull out my folder for one of these live streams and go through it. Actually, I was thinking that might be a fun thing to do one of these days. I have a, a bunch of just like folders and sketchbooks from the BPRD days that I thought it would be fun to sort of flip through. Yeah, we'll get to pump the sort of juice, the library edition version of the sketchbook. <laughs> When you say script work, do you mean like you just want to see what the script, what our Kudi script looked like? Oh, yeah, the Lonesome Hunter scripts are interesting, I think, because they are not, um, like, they're a mess. <laughs> writing, when you're just writing for yourself, you know, you don't have to, you can be pretty wild about it. And so much of the, the work on Lonesome Hunters was just doing um, outlines, just writing an outline and then coming back to it a year later and re rewriting the same outline, but with, you know, slightly different idea. Yeah, I think I will be doing more of my own IP. Like, I think, um, well, we'll see how Lonesome Hunters goes. Uh, it's been doing, it's been doing okay. It hasn't been, you know, the next saga or anything, but um, it's old enough to keep keep going. Um, so we'll see. I kind of hope that, like, as soon as I finish this, I can maybe do um, The Void Without as, you know, with a publisher. I think that would be a fun, like, change of pace after doing this. But at the same time, I'm still kind of trying to see if I can find a way to work on that at the same time. It's just hard to do two books at once. Like, I have done it in the past, and it, 
can kind of break your mind. In fact, when you're really in like working on a story hard, sometimes it's even hard to watch like TV and get other narratives going at the same time. It's at least for me, I can, it makes me feel a little bit anxious. <laughs> I have not seen Hergé's scripts. Hey, wait, hold on. This is like the uh, first pass of my script for Lonesome Hunters number two. And, oops, let me, sorry, sorry. And they are pretty funny, although pretty like like they didn't change a ton you can see this is like the rainforest for here and then this page this is supposed to be this guy laying in the woods and then he has his eyes closed he opens them <gasps> And then he sits up. I actually, it was, it's funny. Like I really struggled for a lot of um, how to organize my brain to do this. And then I was watching, um, what's that uh, Japanese show that uh, Urasawa does? Man, Man Ben, is that what it's called? And they were just showing, it was just, you know, they're showing manga artists and they were showing their, their process and they call this a, a name for some reason. And uh, just a layout like this with the script written on it. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, that's, that's the way to go. Cause you can iterate on a page like so fast, like all of these just took like two seconds to draw and write. And then I can sort of redo it over and over until I get something that works. Yeah, Cameron, Man Ben. That's, um, if anybody doesn't know about it, that is so such a good show. You can find a ton of them on uh, YouTube. Although lots of times they aren't translated or captioned, which um, is a bummer. I kind of wish somebody would collect them all and caption them and release them on DVD or something, Blu-ray. Yeah, I've I've kind of settled on a, a process where I do my thumbnails um, and then I have my iPad open with a word doc and I sort of dictate the dialogue into that as I'm doing my thumbnails. And then I iterate on that a couple times until I get something good.
I was going to show you the layout for this page, but um, oh, there it is. That's just slightly out of order. So here's the. And this one actually changed quite a bit from this from the stage to the final. Yeah, kind of only the the first panel is the only thing I kept, which is interesting. Oh yeah, Cameron, thank you for reminding me. I forgot that he had started doing that. I don't think he does it, or, you know, that Arasawa does his, has his own YouTube channel now with subs. Um, I don't think he does it very consistently though. Yeah, the layouts and thumbnails, Mark, are like, um, you know, it took me years to really understand that that's where comics get made. You can do, like, everything that comes after that is just like, you know, making your hand work. The But the thumbnails and layouts is the real deal. And that's the part, like, I don't know, not to get into the old argument, but that's the part where, you know, the artist is actually doing what I would consider writing. They're planning how to, how to actually tell the story. Plan the work, work the plan. That is exactly it. Man, if I had, if I actually knew how to do layouts, I probably would have started drawing comics, like finishing comics at least, in my 20s instead of um, having my first book come out when I was 35. Because I tried so many times to start drawing a comic and then just, you know never never finished cuz i cuz i always started before i actually had a plan but the planning part is hard that is the hardest part i think of making comics and it can be really frustrating to like sit and draw for, you know, 10 to 12 hours and then only have like, you know, three pages of really terrible stick figures. <laughs> but sometimes that's what it takes to figure out the story. Yeah, I don't remember when I first saw someone else's thumbnails. There was a book. I talk about this all the time. I'm going to go grab it actually to show you. This is one of the best books about uh, how to make comics that I've ever seen. Um, and you can get it off of the Tomorrow's publishing website. 
you can get the PDF, but it basically shows different artists using a working off the same script to do a to do a story, and then they you know they sort of talk through their their plan, like how they approached it, and they show their thumbnails. But it's really like. There's a lot you can learn from this because, like, I don't know how well this is going to show up on camera. Like this, and this are two different artists working off the same script. And you can see it's just night and day sorry there's a cat climbing on my desk it's just it's two different stories even though it's the exact same events the same characters and stuff it is a completely different story depending on the artist anyway working methods by john lowe it's a great book i wish they that they would put out like one of these per year. I would, um, I would pay for a subscription for that. Yeah, I think the artists and writers are both, both authors. It's such a bummer because like. I think most people who make comics understand that. I think um, there is so much of like the the publishing infrastructure that does not understand that. Like when you look at any of the Harrow County books on Amazon, there's a little like about the author, and it lets you it links to Colin Bunn and more of his books on Amazon, but if you like my contribute contribution to the book, you have to do a little more digging. That's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. No, anything that was like not specifically designed for comics ends up being pretty um, hostile to comics artists. Dennis, you mean you bought the copy of uh, Working Methods? Nice. Yeah, I think you will enjoy it. I think everybody would enjoy that book, actually. <laughs> Cameron, that's awesome. I hope that your watercolor set treats you nice. I think watercolor is the one of the funnest mediums out there. Mostly because I'm not worried about destroying my brushes when I do it. 
it's like I got into oil painting a couple years ago and um, just the amount of work to clean your brushes completely every single time. You know, you sit down to draw for or to paint in oils for 20 minutes and then you have to spend 15 minutes cleaning up. Yeah, some of those sketchbook sections for the Harrow County stuff got big. Which is fun. That's always like one of the hardest parts of putting together the trade for me. Because sometimes on a lot of these books, you know, you're just going at such a fast pace that you don't have time to actually do a lot of concept art and stuff. So then my editor sends me an email that's like, send us all your concept art for the sketchbook. And I'm like, I don't, I didn't actually do any, dude. I did it all on the page. Nice. Nice, Cameron. <laughs> 84 pages of sketchbooks. That's amazing. Was that one of the Fregrito books? I should have all of those. I don't remember any of them that were that big, though. Although, I don't know if I've read all of the the Hellboy library editions just because they I'd read them all before I got the library edition. Hey, thanks, Matt. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming by. I'm working on keeping on keeping on. Some days are easier than others. Oh, you know, I don't think I have any of the Hellboy in Hell library editions, actually. I should get on that. I think I was not working on any of the Mignolaverse books when that was coming out. So I was off the mailing list. Being on the comp list for books like that is one of the greatest things about making comics. Oh yeah, I, man, I had to curb my artist editions purchasing. Cause it was gonna bankrupt me, but I need to get the, especially the screw on head one I would love to get. Really want, need to get the, some of the um, Jack Kirby ones too. I'd love to, Look at the uh, commandy one.
see how this works. I'm working a little bit different than I normally do just so people can see kind of what I'm doing. But more and more like the coloring um, is being done with uh, acrylic ink instead of just watercolor. And my secret weapon on that is this glass palette. Nice. I have not, man, there's so many of those library editions now. I haven't even heard of that one. That Gil Kane one. Dang, I did not even know that they were making paperback. Oh, Artisan Edition. That's different than the Artist's Edition, isn't it? Because I know they have a couple, what do they call them? The They have a couple different versions. Like there's some that are, instead of being full stories, are just sort of a collection of different bits of art. Oh, okay. I got you, Bo V. Yeah, the, um, <laughs> that is one thing about those artist editions. I, that's one of the reasons why I actually haven't um, put a ton of effort into buying more, even though I want them so bad. It's just they are very hard to read. I need to get one of those um, like dictionary stands. I don't know if you've ever seen those. It's like a like kind of like a podium, except it's intended to just hold open a big book. I need one of those so I can just sort of move my library editions, cycle them through. So I'll actually look through them more. Actually, I bet there's a market for that for somebody who makes a little artist edition reading stand. That Artisan Edition is still by IDW, isn't it? Yeah, like a lectern, Jeremy. Oh, the, the drug issues of Spider-Man? Was that one of those um, like public service issues that they did?
Well, I think if they're called... <laughs> Just popping pills, huh? I think if they're called Artist Editions, they're IDW. What are they... What does Dark Horse call theirs? Dark Horse calls theirs the Gallery Edition. I have a Elf Quest one of those. That's pretty great. Gonna use a little Payne's Gray ink for this. Jeremy, do you mean that um, Fantagraphics is doing like a library edition style books of Wallywood? Because I have a an IDW one of Wallywood too. Oh yeah, I forgot about that Dan Klaus book. There are there's too much good stuff nowadays, man. <laughs> yeah, I have one of the um, Mobius blueberry things. Those are actually pretty affordable. I think it was less, like, I think it was like 35 or 40 bucks for one of those. But they're hard to get because the, nobody has done, like, a an American version. I think I bought mine from a, a comic shop that imported it. I, you know, letter heck, I've never calculated how long it takes me to do a panel because panels like from panel to panel, it is wildly different. Like it's really impossible to, to gauge. Um, my, my, the way I try to, um, set my quotas for the day of like how much I need to get done is when I'm penciling, I try to pencil three pages a day, um, which is a pretty intense day usually, actually. Um, I'd love to take it down to two, but got to get these books out. Um, and then when I color them, I ink and color a page per day. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> thanks. I appreciate that. Sometimes it feels like um, they're not very detailed to me. Sometimes they feel like they're overly detailed. But I am definitely, you know, one of the things that I learned um, just before I could become a professional cartoonist was just how much um, detail I needed to put into each panel and that I needed to, like, when I was, you know, when I was much younger, when I would draw comics, I would always sort of take the approach of like, okay, what's the least I can get away, do to get away with making this panel look the way I want? And nowadays, my approach is always like, how much can I put in this panel before it's too much? And you know, you can you can overdo it, but um, it's way harder for me to uh, to overdo it than it is for me to underdo it. I don't know if that sentence actually made any sense. <laughs> Yeah, when you're talking about like how long it takes different artists to do different stuff, it's it's important. Like it's good info to have, I think. And I think it's good to have sort of like um, a target for how much you want to get done. Um, but it's also important to remember that everybody is different and everybody works at a different pace and has different goals for their artwork. So like it's like one person's working methods are not going to work for you necessarily. I tell you what, streaming slows me way down. Part of it is just that I have my desk set up in a kind of an awkward position trying to get the camera to work. And I got my old lop laptop sitting right on the side here too, which sort of cramping my style a little bit. Oh, no way. You saw it in Australia? That is great to hear. Stone King is one of those books that, like, its publishing history is a little convoluted, so I don't hear as much about it as I would like to. Although I did get a, a box of comps a couple months ago, and um, but I haven't been doing conventions, so I haven't had any way to anything to do with them. I'm really proud of Stone King. I think that book turned out really fun. I would really like to do more um, high fantasy kind of stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I would love to hire that 
whoever writes all the corny puns for how it's made. I actually have like a a thing that I always pay attention to when I watch those that because it cracks me up. It's so inconsistent. Like uh, the people who work in the factories or whatever, sometimes they're workers, sometimes they're technicians, sometimes they're artisans, sometimes they are um, like engineers. Like they have like all these different names and it doesn't seem to have any uh, rhyme or reason to why they call any of the you know any of the people what they call them i think i would like to be called the worker the worker adds black ink to the comic book page to add shading Yeah, Jeremy, I do. I pencil digitally nowadays using uh, Clip Studio Paint. I think it's my process. I've been feeling a little bit like um, I've been wanting to pencil on paper again. Um, but there's just, there's so many advantages to penciling digitally, especially when I work analog like this, I can do a lot of sort of like, you know, edits and, and corrections. But when you, if you pencil on the same paper that you paint on, you can't like, you know, erase too, too hard without tearing up the paper. I have heard rumors that there is a, there may be a 16 inch iPad coming out soon. And if that happens, like, man, that would definitely become my, my go-to.
Finally, what? Yeah, no, it, finally a 16-inch iPad would be amazing. I I wish they'd make a 32-inch iPad. I would buy that, you know, I'd buy that in a heartbeat. Um, I've, Bo, you know, I've never really thought about going fully digital. Um, I just don't like, I don't enjoy working in front of my computer very much. I do it for my pencils, but um, that's one of the motivators to let me, you know, pencil three pages a day is to get it over with. I find that, like, I can sit in front of a paper about twice as long as I can in front of a computer before I just start getting really exhausted. I don't really know why. Back when I was doing video games, I used to be able to sit, you know, and do 18 hour days without it really getting to me. But not anymore. The end of 2023, huh? For that 16 inch. Yeah, if they did that and if they um, let you run OS X on it, that would be like every artist I know would drop everything and buy that. Yeah, Cameron, digital watercolors, like they get better and better. Like every year, something, you know new stuff comes out, but it still is like, um, just doesn't quite look the same, obviously, but it does also like, it takes way longer than just doing it in real life. Like there's stuff that to get some sort of analog effect, you have to work so hard when you could just do it, you know, in 10 minutes in real life. You would photograph stuff with an iPad? Not with an iPad, but with something like one? That's weird. Not like, uh, was that like an old digital camera style thing before digital cameras were cool? Wow, letter heck, that sounds wild. I used to kind of uh, 
dream of having stuff like that, like a giant, like a giant jafting table. That the whole thing was a computer monitor. But now, like, I have a, I have a thirty-two inch. No, I don't. I have the twenty-six inch Cintiq. I have a big Cintiq, and it still just makes me want to get off of it when I when I work on it. Although I should say that working digitally has, um, I've gotten more used to it in recent years than I was. When I stopped doing video games, it was like I was done being in front of a computer all day. And very, very slowly I'm getting back to it. But I don't see any I don't see any reason to go full digital with anything. For one thing, it's really nice to have these full color originals to sell. People like those. Hey comic crack. Hey, Letterheck, what was that thing called? Was there like a, a brand name on it? And no, Cameron, I have not ever heard of... Is that Mateus? Or Benowicz? <laughs> yeah, but just about everything's better than an NFT. Oh, that's cool, Letterhack. I was, um, my very first art job was designing kids' clothes. Doing, like, uh, t-shirt designs and, like, all-over prints and stuff like that. And that, actually, I got that job in 90, uh, 92, I guess. And they were, um... When I started, we were doing the color separations by hand, and then we had to get trained on using Corel Draw to do our color separations. Exciting times. I'll look into that dude, Cameron. This sounds interesting. Man, I can't tell you how bad I would love to try to work in Japan for a little while. What? You did color? Oh, yeah, the color separations in Quark. Man, I used to love Quark back in the day. It was rock solid. Yeah, did you ever use the Ruby Lith to do color seps? That was the most satisfying. 
In fact, I had like I can't even remember where I found. It. I think I was like in a in an used like an office surplus store one time and found a roll of ruby lith and bought it even though I had no absolutely no reason to use it and I was just uh just wanted to have it. Hey, Daniel, thanks for dropping by. Yeah, you know, if you're interested in original art, you can check out uh, cadencecomicart.com. That's my my art agent. And there's some stuff on there that's, like, reasonably priced. I think, I think uh, a lot of BPRD stuff is, like, you know, under 200 bucks. Yeah, ninety four, ninety five would be like the end of the Ruby Lith era. Really glad I got to do that, though. You know, like there's a lot of people who will never get to learn to do the color separation and print prep that uh, doing it by hand gives you. <laughs> you know, I never had cork lock on me. But, you know, I didn't, I only used it for a year or two before I sort of got out of the print and pre press biz. That was actually, I got into doing website design for a long time. And that was mainly because I was so sick of doing color separations and running film and all that jazz. To get original art, uh, Cadence Comic Art. There you go, Daniel. Oh, nice. I'm glad you're liking those time lapses. I have so many of those that I've recorded and have not edited. I need to get, I need to get on that. But it's hard when there's comics to get done. That's one of those things, man. Like at the beginning of this, this year, I was all for certain. I'm like, I'm going to get my YouTube channel like dialed in and start like making a lot of videos for that. And then it just turns out that being a video editor is a whole nother job. That's what I've been really loving these streams because they're very low effort. I can just sort of set up the camera and hit go, which is nice. Oh, no way, Jeremy. I used to do, uh, that was my second art job was a graphic design and pre-press place and doing uh, yellow page ads was uh, like our bread and butter. Those things were like, man, like, cause they were the one I, the ones I was doing were we could do black, uh, red and blue colors. And they, um, the registration on them was so bad. We had to leave like, Ugh, like a 16th inch bleed on stuff if we wanted it to to match up doing phone book ads though that's dead technology man no one will do those again all right well i think i'm kind of losing steam for the night uh, I don't remember who the the company was. It was in San Diego. Um, yeah, I just remember the the salespeople would come in um, like once a week, and they'd just drop off a bunch of folders with stuff. 
and uh, they'd have the little uh, order form with all the copy handwritten out on it and stuff. One of the best lessons I ever learned, actually, was doing a, a phone book ad for a tow truck company. And the owner of the company actually ended up coming into the office to help me work out the design because I was doing it too good. And he had to explain to me that, like, if I made an ad that looked very, very nice, everyone would assume that he was too expensive. So I had to make it look kind of crappy so that uh, people would call him instead of, you know, thinking he would be affordable. Okay, I'm calling it quits. Thank you so much, everybody, for dropping by. Um, I'm trying to post more stuff on Tumblr. Um, if you want to see more stuff throughout the week and, uh, you know, trying to reduce my reliance on Twitter. So doing Tumblr and my Instagram and stuff. So, uh, yeah, follow me there if you're not already. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you next week.